Okay, it's seven o'clock. We can get started. Hi, I'm Al Musella, and this is the uh, Brain Tumor Webinar Series. Today's special guest host is Dr. Manmeet Aluwalia. From uh, he's a professor at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, he's director and head of operations of the Burkhart Brain Tumor and Neuro Oncology Center at the Cleveland Clinic. And today's lecture is going to be on immunotherapy of brain tumors. Um, take it. Take it back to Ali Wali, yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to start off by thanking Al for his uh, relentless and contributions. So thanks for doing that, Al. Uh, I'm extremely excited and honored to be here and speaking to you about something that is very close to my heart, and that's about treatment options for patients with glioblastoma. Uh, as you probably are aware, glioblastoma is an aggressive brain tumor. It is also the most common tumor that we see every year in the United States. Despite our best options, overall survival needs improvement. Few of our patients survive five years. However, I would like to make a point that this seems to be getting better due to clinical trials. And I will talk to you about some of the exciting avenues that we and several others are working on, especially with immunotherapy which we think will not only offer new treatments for our patients, which hopefully will be less toxic, but will also provide opportunities for patients to live longer and have a better quality of life. So as you can see, uh, this is a very infiltrative tumor. Uh, the MRIs kind of show that uh, this is the patient uh, who's got uh, an infiltrative uh, thalamic tumor. Under the microscope, you can see cells kind of invading this is a tumor that is marked by infiltrative growth. There's a lot of hypoxia. This is a fast growing tumor. And there are certain requirements in WHO classification which makes a glioblastoma, which may be too deep for this audience. But uh, one of the things that I want to point out is as compared to other cancers, this type of tumor needs more work. And I, I want to share, uh, based on input from uh, Al, uh, he had asked me to talk about immunotherapy in glioblastoma. So broadly speaking, uh, there are a num number of ways where immunotherapy can be used to treat patients with glioblastoma. Uh, I'm going to focus on three different trials that uh, I and my group are involved with, but also show about the various approaches that can be taken in glioblastoma. So first, I'm going to talk for around 10 minutes about a phase two trial of a vaccine called survivan-based vaccine in newly diagnosed glioblastoma that we and several others have been working on. Second, I'm going to move on to a phase two trial of nivolumab along with low dose bevacizumab compared to nivolumab with standard dose of bevacizumab in recurrent glioblastoma. Then I'm going to talk about um, a viral based approach, which we are very excited about. And this is going to be leading to a phase two, three trial of TOCA 511 and TOCA FC in newly diagnosed glioblastoma, something which is coming through a cooperative group. So before I start my presentation, I just want to highlight this uh, for uh, the patients and families out there. Uh, this is NCCN guidelines. Uh, and um, what this says is standard treatments for patients with glioblastoma. But as you can clearly say, that they say that consider a clinical trial. And if it's available, is preferred for eligible patients. So highly encourage people to look for clinical trials and would like to thank people like Al and his foundation that relentlessly serves our patients by routing them to institutions that have clinical trials. So the first part of my talk is gonna focus on a phase two trial of survivan based vaccine in newly diagnosed glioblastoma. Uh, this is a collaborative work as you can see between uh, Cleveland Clinic, Dana-Farber, Mass General, Beth Israel, uh, all these cancer centers are part of the Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Center, and Roswell Park, where the vaccine was actually invented. Uh, I had worked on the labs of Dr. Robert Finstemecker and Dr. Mike Shishelsky, who are the co-inventors of this vaccine. Uh, so to give you some background, uh, as you all know, there is significant interest in immunotherapy as a therapeutic option in glioblastoma. We know that immunotherapy works in a number of cancers and has really changed the outcome of patients with cancers. And a number of these patients who are treated with immunotherapy in other cancers are living long-term 
and with a good quality of life. So we wanted to look at this particular vaccine that targets survival. And survival is basically expressed on cancer cells. It's generally not expressed in the normal cells in the brain. It basically survival inhibits apoptosis based protein and apoptosis is a way in which dysregulated cells die. So if that pathway is turned off, the cells can live forever. So this vaccine goes and interacts with that surviving and stops it and indirectly can cause cancer cell death, which could be direct due to cellular toxicity, means a direct impact on the cell, or it can help to mount an immune response and an in antibody response, which can also go and kill the cancer cell. So the treatment schema of this particular trial, uh, that actually has fully accrued, and I'll talk about uh, how the patients did. So everyone undergoes a tumor resection. This is typical. Any patients with glioblastoma undergoes surgery. Then typically, as you know, patients take two to four years to heal when they start chemotherapy and radiation. And typical treatment is six weeks of radiation from Monday to Friday, and everyone gets a, a chemotherapy called temozolomide. This is then followed typically by a rest period, so four weeks. And that's when the adjuvant treatment with temozolomide starts and patients can use Optune along with temozolomide. So in this particular trial, the vaccine actually started after the chemotherapy and radiation was over along with adjuvant temozolomide. And everyone received four priming doses of vaccine two weeks apart. And then if they did well, then they would get maintenance vaccine every 12 weeks until they were either getting benefit, that means that the tumor is not growing, or they were not having intolerable toxicity. So the results was, this was uh, 63 patients were enrolled. Median age was very comparable, which we see in our patients, 60 years of age. The range was patients as young as 20 years participated, but we had patients as old as 82 years of age, means the vaccine was well tolerated. We had slightly higher preponderance of males as what we see in the disease and uh, relatively fewer females. Survival expression was found in all tumors. 53 patients were IDH wild type and eight were IDH mutant. This is again very comparable to what we see. We know in glioblastoma, five to 10% of patients will be IDH mutant, 90 to 95% are wild type. 33 patients had uh, MGMT promoter methylation, while 29 patients were, uh, had an unmethylated MGMT promoter. These are some of the initial data that we are seeing, which looks very interesting. So this is from diagnosis to walk you through. The left part of the graph uh, is overall survival, uh, which you can see in the purple curve, and then progression-free survival, which is in the red curve. This is from diagnosis, so overall survival uh, at 12 months was 94%, which looks very promising. Progression-free survival at six months was 96%, almost 97%. Now, the second uh, graph is the same. Uh, again, looking at uh, overall survival and progression-free survival. Now, here, uh, the overall survival was at 12 months was 81%. Now, this is from start of the vaccine. So, as you remember from the last slide, uh, patients initially got surgery, then there was a four-week period of healing, and then they got six weeks of chemotherapy radiation, and vaccine typically started two to four weeks after that. Hence, we are looking at overall survival both from diagnosis, but also from start of the treatment, where both of these outcomes look promising. Now, then we wanted to look at, based on the MGMT stratification, how these patients did. And we know from our experience that patients who have MGMT methylation of the promoter, they typically do well as compared to those who have unmethylated MGMT. And here you can see uh, in the blue curves, those patients with MGMT did better than those who had unmethylated MGMT in the red curves, both for progression-free survival from diagnosis as well as progression-free survival from the start of the treatment. Now, this is a slide that is now focusing on the overall survival. And as you can see on, from the diagnosis, that most of the patients are alive even at one year. And then you can see the flattening of the curve here, uh, where you know, most patients who did well have done well really long. 
And this is what is so exciting about immunotherapies. And this is the major takeaway. If patients do well, then they do well for a long period of time, as you can see in terms of progression-free survival here, but more importantly, overall survival in the blue curve on the left and the lavender curve on the right. Now, outcomes are better in methylated patients as compared to unmethylated patients, and that's what we are seeing on our trials. Methylated patients do really well. Unmethylated patients do well, but there's still more work that needs to be done for this patient population. This is a waterfall uh, uh, curve of overall survival and progression-free survival. The dark blues are progression-free survival, and the light blues are overall survival. And as you can see, number of patients doing well uh, for prolonged periods of time. And this was seen at all the centers uh, and, and, and all the ages. This is putting this trial in perspective compared to what we have in terms of treatment. So to walk you through, uh, the red uh, curve here is the uh, outcomes that we are seeing with this trial. And as you can see, the overall survival looks much better than what we see in uh, typical patients. Uh, obviously with the caveat that patients had to have surgery and they needed to do well after surgery to go on this trial, have chemotherapy radiation and should not be progressing when they started on the vaccine. Uh, but the median progression free survival is 11 months and the overall survival is in the ballpark of 26 months, which compares favorably to the uh, temozolomide arm or the Optune arm in the trial that got the Optune approved. So definitely exciting data. And on the basis of this data, the FDA has given uh, the vaccine an orphan uh, drug status. Uh, now, obviously, everyone, when they look at good data, are also interested in seeing whether the treatment is toxic or not. And what we found out on this trial was this is a fairly well-tolerated vaccine. Most adverse events were grade one, and they were mostly uh, injection site reactions. So when if people have gotten a shot, they know that, that generally they have a pain for a day or two uh, after a, a vaccine shot. And this is what we basically saw in our patient population. A very small number of patients had grade three toxicities. Now we do see these grade C toxicities with temozolomide as well in our patient population. And these numbers were very comparable to what we are seeing in patients who are treated with chemotherapy alone. So uh, chemotherapy plus vaccine did not lead to any substantial increase in the toxicity. This is a complex slide, but basically the message I want to give with this slide is twofold. One is typically survival is a predictor of poor outcome. Patients who have higher survival expression normally do not do as well as patients who have lower expression of survival. And this vaccines, because it counteracts survival, takes away that negative effect. So patients who, whether they had high expression of survival or low expression of survival, did equally well as trial. So if someone gets a high expression of survival, they get this vaccine, they do relatively better as compared to someone who has a lower expression of survival, which is only intuitive. If you have a protein against which you are mounting a vaccine, you're gonna get more response. The other exciting part was that patients did well, no matter whether they were young or old, as you can see in this last part of the curve here. So uh, this is really good for our patients because uh, half of our patients tend to be 65 years of age or older. So the conclusions for this study was that this is a safe vaccine, it could be combined well with temozolomide, and especially we saw benefit in unmethylated MGMT patients. Compared to the historical control, obviously this was not a randomized trial, so I will accept that as a caveat, but we had seen a very promising progression free survival and overall survival in this patient population. Patients with poor prognostic factors, that means patients who typically don't do well, like unmethylated MGMT or higher expression of survival levels, did well when they got this vaccine. Now we have two trials which are being planned with this vaccine. Uh, one of them should be opening at Cleveland Clinic very in near future, within the next month or so. This is combining the vaccine with an anti-PD-1 drug. And I'm gonna to come to that next. There is a lot of excitement with anti-PD-1 drugs like Ketruda and uh, Obdivo or uh, Pembrolizumab or Nivolumab. And these are approved in a number of other cancers and have been looked at in patients with uh, glioblastoma as well. And then on the basis of this trial, a randomized trial in newly diagnosed glioblastoma is planned. And we are hoping that this may open by the end of the year. 
So I am going to shift gears now uh, towards immunotherapy. So first part, one third of the talk was to focus on vaccines. This uh, one third of the part will focus on immunotherapies. These are immunotherapies which are given intravenously. And the two most commonly used uh, immunotherapies in most cancers include nivolumab or uh, brand name is Abdivo or pembrolizumab, where the brand name is Keytruda. Uh, this was the largest trial uh, done with the immunotherapy in recurrent glioblastoma. Was a, was a fairly large study. Uh, was a multi-center study which was done by BMS, the company that makes nivolumab. And what they showed was nivolumab, which is immunotherapy, uh, fared no better than bevacizumab or avastin, which is what we commonly use in our patient population. And here are the two curves. So basically, the curves are overlapping or overlying each other. That means there is no benefit of nivolumab as compared to bevacizumab. But the patients who were on this did not have any survival difference. That's what this slide means. The right part of the uh, graph basically talks about progression-free survival. And what this means is how much time will the tumor not grow? So here you can see the light blue is the bevacizumab and the dark blue is nivolumab. So patients who get bevacizumab or avastin, we know get a benefit for a reasonable amount of time. Nivolumab, the patients were growing faster. The tumors were growing faster. And what, what we wanted to see was why this was happening. And one of the challenges that we have in our patient population in glioblastoma is when you have a tumor in the brain, it actually uh, induces a mass effect. That means the tumor pushes on the normal parts of the brain. And this induces a swelling and, or edema, as your doctors may like to call it. And often we use steroids, which are the best way to decrease the edema. So as you can see with this slide, uh, the dark blue, which is the nivolumab arm, uh, almost 40% of patients were on steroids, some form of steroids. And on an average, they were up to 2 milligrams of dexamethasone. But as you can see, when patients were on nivolumab longer, more and more of them needed to be on steroids. As compared to bevacizumab, which is an agent that can decrease the swelling by itself, you could actually see there was initially an increase, but then a, a decrease in the requirement of steroids. Steroids are not good for immunotherapy because steroids decrease or dampen the immune system. And for immunotherapy to work, we actually need immune system to be robust. We also know that glioblastoma by itself is an immunosuppressive tumor. What that means is patients who have glioblastoma will have dampening of your immune system. And we do know that patients who have lower immune system uh, as measured by CD4 counts typically don't do as well as compared to patients who have a more robust immune system, at least as demonstrated by higher CD4 count, who typically tend to do better when treated with our standard treatments. So this is a trial that we have ongoing at Cleveland Clinic, uh, which is an investigator-initiated effort that is being led out of our group. Uh, this trial is also open at Dana-Farber right now, uh, and it's a 90-patient study. But what we have done about this trial is very interesting. We found that in our previous trial, the patients who had a response to nivolumab had a response that lasted longer. That means if patients' tumor shrank, their tumors shrank for close to a year as compared to bevacizumab, where typically the tumors shrink, they shrink for four to six months. So here we are combining these two drugs. Everyone is getting the full dose of nivolumab. Uh, and in one arm, we are giving the standard dose of avastin or bevacizumab but one arm is actually getting a lower dose of bevacizumab or avastin. And when we launched this trial, our thought process was maybe that the lower dose bevacizumab may have lower toxicity as compared to the standard dose of bevacizumab. And the other interesting reason to do this was that there is some thought process that when we use the standard doses of bevacizumab or avastin, initially the tumor shrinks, but we cause more hypoxia because bevacizumab goes and shuts the blood supply to the cancer cells, and then they get hypoxia, and then they can have a more of an angry phenotype, something called as a mesenchymal phenotype. So our thought was maybe we can have a better response by a lower dose bevacizumab as compared to standard dose of uh, bevacizumab or avastin. And what I can tell you is this uh, trial is uh, enrolling very quickly, uh, and we are also seeing some good initial responses about which we are very excited about.
And this is a snapshot of some of our patients who have come at, to Cleveland Clinic. Uh, so right now, as I said, we have around four, over 45 patients in, enrolled, in fact, 47. Uh, the green star is, uh, shows Cleveland. Uh, obviously, a number of our patients are from our own area, but we have seen patients from neighboring states. We have seen patients from as far as Idaho, Colorado, Tennessee, uh, Missouri. Uh, and so uh, we also had a patient internationally who came and relocated to Cleveland to get treatment. This is a snapshot of some of the investigator-initiated trials. That means these trials are typically open at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, now, uh, obviously, in interest of time, I cannot go over each of them. But we have uh, two phase one trials of ruxlitinib and ibrutinib. Ruxlitinib is a drug that targets the jack stat pathway, which is very important in uh, glioblastoma. And we have a study of this drug combining with radiation and temozolomide. Uh, the second trial is a trial of ibrutinib. Ibrutinib is a drug that is, can be immunomodulatory as well. And it targets the BMX pathway and the PTK pathway. Now, this drug has shown to have very interesting and impress, impressive response rates in lymphomas and some forms of leukemia. In fact, this drug has also been associated to have a lot of uh, interesting and impressive activity seen in primary CNS lymphoma. So our trial is testing this drug in newly diagnosed glioblastoma. Then for patients whose glioblastoma comes back despite the best treatment, we have the nivolumab and bevacizumab trial that I talked about. We also have a trial of giving a low dose capecitabine, basically which is a 5 fluorouracil oral drug. And here we are trying to dampen the immune system. Uh, sorry, we are trying to uh, guard against the cells that dampen the immune system called myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And here we are combining this drug, capecitabine. We take these patients to surgery then. And then after surgery, they get bevacizumab and capecitabine. We have an upcoming trial of the Survivin vaccine where it will be combined with pembrolizumab or Keytruda. And this trial should open in hopefully in the next month or so. And Unfortunately, we also know that our patients, when they get bevacizumab, get benefit for a duration of time. And when the tumor comes back, we don't have a lot of good options. So we are working on getting a trial of regrafenib, which is an oral drug that has shown to work well in patients who fail bevacizumab in colon cancer. And we are trying to see if this drug will work well for our patients with glioblastoma. In the next uh, 10 minutes or so of my chat, I would talk about uh, you know, some of the clinical trials. And this slide... Uh, talks about our enrollment at Cleveland Clinic. And as we have had more interesting trials, we are seeing more and more patients coming to our center. And we are very happy because as I talked about, the NCCN guidelines are that patients with glioblastoma should ideally be treated on a clinical trial. So uh, if any one of you uh, has uh, any questions, obviously I'll be happy to answer them. And uh, I will also be able to share information if you want to reach out to us to find out more about these trials. Obviously, Al and his group are a great resource for any brain tumor patient. Uh, the last uh, seven to eight minutes, I'm going to talk about this trial where we are looking at a viral-based approach. There are a number of viral-based approaches, as you know, uh, which are being looked at in the country. Uh, the polio virus uh, with the tube group, the DNA Trix virus with the MD Anderson group and the DNA Trix company. And so this is a TOCA 511. I believe uh, their team will be coming on soon in the next week or two, I was told by Al. So there you'll get a much more detailed in, uh, information about this virus. But basically, this is a genetically engineered virus. And what they have done is taken advantage of a fact that viruses have a propensity to go and infect the cancer cells. And we know cancer cells are bad. We need to find a way to kill those cancer cells and at the same time, we want to avoid the toxicity that the human body can take. So the advantage of using viruses in cancer cells is that they selectively infect the cancer cells as compared to normal cells. But if a virus enters a normal cell, they are rapidly eliminated because the immune system, which is uh, either innately there in the human body or there is acquired immunity, can help clear a virus. A uh, virus can spread throughout the immune system uh, uh, throughout the tumor without often triggering the immune system. And virus, these viruses, these genetically engineered viruses generally will only infect dividing cells. So typically, uh, these genetically engineered viruses can be given to patients of cancer. And over a period of time, these virals goes and infect all the cancer cells. 
So the other thing that is interesting about this TOCA 511 is it basically uh, is a virus that causes a change in the cytosine DMNES. So it's basically a, it's an enzyme that can convert TOCA FC. A TOCA FC is nothing but an antifungal prodrug that is patented by this company called Tocogen. And in the tumor cell, this then gets converted into 5-fluorouracil, which is an anti-cancer drug. We do know that 5-fluorouracil works in colon cancers. And again, I had talked to you about one of the trials that we are doing at Cleveland Clinic. We are using 5-fluorouracil or oral forms of that called capecitabine in low doses to kill the myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So this virus takes an advantage of this phenomenon. And so how does this look like? Uh, if a patient has tumor, uh, typically a surgeon will go in and try to remove it. And when they are doing the surgery, they also give 40 injections of this virus of 0.1 ml, which are typically able to do in a patient where they are going to remove around 80% of the tumor. And then the patients will generally heal. And once they heal, they can get this pro drug uh, called TOCA FC, which is in form of capsules that you take. And in the tumor, this then gets converted to 5-fluorouracil, which becomes a chemotherapy drug. And this, the advantage of this is that this uh, only happens in the cells which are infected by the virus, which are generally the cancer cells. So you have relatively non-toxic treatment. Also, we do know that the uh, cancer cells that are infected with, by viruses become more easily uh, killed by the immune system. The innate immune system can kill them. And then there are these uh, graphics show that there is a lot of necrosis that can happen in these patients due to immune system activation. And you can see these lymphocytes presence uh, in purple or pink, which show that the immune cells are actually infiltrating these cancer cells. Again, like I talked about, when we give patients treatment, an important part is not only how well the patients are doing, but an, another critical part is how well tolerated the treatment is. So here you can see most of the patients who were treated with the uh, TOCA 511 uh, had uh, very limited toxicity. And so it was a well tolerated treatment. And similarly, TOCA FC now, so this is the fungal part of the uh, treatment. This is the fungal drug. Here you can see it's relatively on toxic treatment. Most of the patients had fatigue or diarrhea. And we know some of our patients can typically have fatigue as a part of their cancer and the treatment. The interesting part about this, although this data uh, cutoff, as you can see, is from uh, August 15th, maybe uh, Harry Gruber will have more updated outcomes uh, when he presents the data. Uh, but in patients who were treated with this virus in phase one studies, so this virus was looked at three phase one studies. And for people who are not about a phase one study, typically phase one studies are when we are finding out what's the best dose to give to our patients. Phase two studies look at the effectiveness of drugs typically. And in randomized phase two studies or randomized phase three studies, we look at whether a drug or a intervention will do better than a standard intervention. So looking at this, uh, patients who uh, had, uh, all patients, we saw response rates in 11%. Uh, and by response rates, we mean that the tumors either shrank by more than 50% or completely went away. But when we looked at those patients who got the higher doses of the virus, which is what will be used in phase three studies going forward, almost 22% of them had shrinkage of their tumor or they had a complete response. That means the tumor went away completely. Now this 22% looks very favorably as compared to the responses that we'd seen with the chemotherapies with our patients, which is typical in the ballpark of 5%. Now, obviously we see higher response rates with uh, medications like bevacizumab or Avastin, but we know some of that is an imaging artifact. That means that the pictures look better, but the patients may or may not do as well. And this slide shows about uh, overall association of durable responses with overall survival. And on the top are most of the patients who have a response. And you can see that these patients are also living much longer. And this is the premise which we have seen with viral-based approaches, as we have seen with polio virus, where 20% of the patients were alive at three years uh, with uh, polio virus in recurrent uh, patients with glioblastoma, which is very impressive. So similarly with this virus, this number is around 20%. Uh, and the uh, 
the experiments were done to look at could this virus work even better with radiation and here this this is a mouse study uh, but basically the take home message is that this uh, virus uh, and the uh, five flora uracil or five flora cytosine works very well with radiation as you can see in the red curves mice who are receiving radiation after a tumor being put in live much longer if they get a viral implantation and get uh, the the pro drug or the anti fungal drug with radiation so on the basis of that this is a large trial which is being looked at through the cooperative groups uh, i'm involved with the study as are several other people and here patients will undergo surgery and half of them will undergo standard of care which will be removal of the tumor by surgery and then chemotherapy and maintenance temozolomide and then patients will go on to receive optune in the uh, in the experimental arm patients will get the viral implantation and then they will get the standard chemotherapy radiation but will also get the fungal drug as long as they are getting benefit or they are not having any intolerable toxicity so uh, obviously uh, as all of you know it takes a village to take care of our patients uh, this is our group at cleveland clinic we are very excited about the clinical trials that we have for our patients uh, here uh, as you can see uh, a team of neurosurgeons radiationologists medical oncologists neuro oncologists work in hand in hand with our nurses and nurse practitioners and it's a all in all a group effort to provide a multidisciplinary approach to provide individualized care for our patients so thank you so much for your kind attention i'll turn it over to al and i'll be happy to answer any questions okay thank you very much that was very informative um we have a few questions first i want to start off with a few simple clinical trial questions first just general clinical trials not these specific trials uh when you talked about the different grades of toxicity such as like a grade 3 rash Can you just explain what grade uh, what the grades are the grading system? Yeah so so typically you know that most patients are uh, you know commonly see and that's uh, the blood counts okay so typically the grade of toxicities can go from 1 to 5 and 1 or the lower number is relatively not as bad five or the higher number is bad five actually means death and three and four are considered high uh, so at one or two it's typically uh, a great toxicity that means if the normal uh, ab- absolute neutrophil counts for say example is 1500 if someone would have a grade one toxicity it will drop down to like a thousand so it means that it is lower than normal but it's not very low a grade 2 would be one that will drop down even further than that grade 3 would typically be even lower than that and gets to a point where typically most medications are stopped so so basically a grade 3 rash would be some kind of a rash that would cover more than 50% of the body uh, so typically in those cases you tend to stop the drug A grade four, four would be even be more severe with higher eruptions of a rash. Grade one or two rash would be a lower grade rash, which would be uh, maybe involving like ten percent of the body. If you have less than ten percent involvement, it typically is a grade one rash. So, so the toxicities go from one to four, and five obviously you never want that because that unfortunately death. And typically we see grade five toxicities very very rarely in our patient population. Okay. Yep. I'm sorry go on uh, so i just wanted to give an example of temozolomide which you know most patients are aware of is the most commonly used chemotherapy in our patients grade 3 or 4 toxicity that's the really bad one is seen in around 5 to 10% that means your blood counts will drop to a degree that your doctors may have to stop your drugs okay uh, the other question is when do you start a clinical trial like i know there's certain specific times when you're newly diagnosed is that before surgery after surgery before radiation after radiation when do you have to start making those decisions so i will say so my one uh, humble request and advice to people is start early uh, so unfortunately as soon as people get a diagnosis or someone even tells them that there is a worry of diagnosis i recommend reaching out and uh, reaching out to larger centers that have uh, you know brain tumor centers of excellence 
and there are several of them around the country. Uh, and if you can get a surgery at a major academic center or a brain tumor center of excellence, I think that's always helpful. Uh, because typically there you have neurosurgeons who pretty much only operate on brain tumor patients. Out in the community, you may have a neurosurgeon, but that neurosurgeon, you know, they do brain tumor surgery, but they could also be doing spine surgeries. And also the larger centers typically have uh, more uh, equipment where they can do better surgeries, like an intraoperative MRI, where the surgeons can... So the challenge with surgery, for example, in glioblastoma is you want to get the maximum tumor out, but you don't want to cause any paralysis or a deficit for a patient that will render them uh, you know, either with a problem with the speech or a weakness in one side of hand or legs or the body. So typically, uh, surgeons will uh, operate to an extent that's safe. So to answer the trial question, the opportunities to participate in a trial can start even before diagnosis. For example, our tocogen trial that will be newly diagnosed glioblastoma actually will start even before the diagnosis is actually made in the OR. So the surgeons will get a consent of the patient that if they find a glioblastoma, that they will instill or implant the virus during the surgery. Now, most often though, newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients undergo a clinical trial after they've undergone surgery and then they know that there's a diagnosis of glioblastoma. So most drugs typically start along with uh, either chemotherapy like temozolomide and radiation. Now, some trials will start after the chemotherapy and radiation. So as you know, the Optune trial started in that phase. Everyone went through six weeks of chemotherapy and radiation, and then patients got Optune. Similarly, our vaccine trial, the survival based vaccine trial that I talked about also started in that space. Patients had finished chemotherapy radiation. And if for some reason, someone does not undergo in trial at that stage, typically they have to wait till the tumor either comes back or is not responding to the standard drugs, and which is something what we term as recurrent glioblastoma. And typically that's the time that patients can go on a clinical trial. Okay, so several, several time points. Sorry, a detailed answer for a question. <laughs> okay. There's something that I've been wondering all along. A lot of times we see it a drug do very good in phase one, phase two trials, then they fail the phase three. I don't understand how something like that could happen with, for example, the Celdex or the ICT-107 vaccine. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, Al, you've, you've touched upon something extremely important. And I, I, I think the, uh, so there's a twofold answer to this. And I, if I may use both of your examples to put this in perspective. Uh, obviously, it is heartbreaking for us physicians and heartbreaking for patients because, you know, we are always excited about something that looks good in phase two uh, to pan out to be negative in phase three, which is not uncommon, not only in glioblastoma, but the rest of the cancer too. Uh, a lot of cancers, different cancers, uh, a number of drugs that are shown to be successful in two may not be successful in three. Uh, and I think some, there are a number of uh, limitations which are there and I can address them. So for example, what happened with in the cell decks was when they had used the, uh, the outcomes of the group, they actually did not use the subgroup outcomes as well as they should have from the TCGA. And what we found out was that those who had the EGFR uh, V3 variant, they did really well in the normal group. And when they had used some of the uh, normal groups or historical controls, they'd used most of the patients or just saw all the glioblastomas as together. And what we know is that the subtypes of glioblastoma can behave very differently. Uh, it's just a very heterogeneous tumor. Often we lump that together for lack of better uh, subtyping in real time and having good approaches for them. And I think this is changing now because we are trying to look at more enriched populations going forward. So that was one of the challenges we faced with cell decks. Now, in terms of uh, the ICT, uh, and obviously you have better experience with me uh, with uh, that, Al, as you know, but there were some subgroups that actually got benefit. And unfortunately, uh, when you, your subgroups are getting benefit, the way FDA sees things is, if you identify those subgroups ahead of time and say, we are going to primarily look at these subgroups, then they look at that data in a more favorable manner as compared to you picking uh, those uh, subgroups retrospectively or post hoc. That means 
you did the trial for all the 100 patients, but then at a later stage, tried to find out why 25% of them were doing well. And we and several others are working uh, hard to circumvent this in future. So just to give you an example, the nivolumab and bevacizumab trial that we are doing at Cleveland Clinic, we are trying to look at the genomic profiling of the patients. So I did not share some data, obviously, in um, in interest of obviously that it's not uh, available for public sharing right now, but we are seeing some interesting responses and we are also seeing some imaging characteristics of our ability to predict who's going to get benefit. So not only are we seeing higher response rates than what we thought we would, but we are also beginning to see some signatures of blood-based biomarkers uh, where we are seeing the myeloid derived suppressor cells and we are seeing the changes of these cells as people are getting treatment, where uh, either before or within eight weeks, we have a better idea of who's going to respond versus not. So going forward, if we will make our phase three trials more biomarker rich or subtype rich, that means not only giving a common strategy, one fits uh, every one approach, but more like uh, specific drugs, specific subtypes. So to give you an example, uh, breast cancer, as all of you know, is very common, or lung cancer, as you know, is very common. But now what we are finding out is that the breast cancers are commonly divided into three types. One type is those who have hormone-responsive breast cancer. Other ones is those who are driven by this mutation called the HER2 mu. And the third type is the triple negative, where none of these markers are positive. And these patients tend to behave very differently based on what type they have and their drugs are very different based on the types of breast cancer they have. Similarly, the same thing goes for lung cancer, where the EGFR mutations have much different outcomes as compared to those we see with the EGFR-driven tumors in glioblastoma. So I think as uh, more and more genomic profiling becomes the uh, commonly used practice in patient care, we will have more and more of these more sophisticated or more uh, molecularly driven trials in future and hopefully see more success than what we have seen in the past. Perfect. Okay, now I want to talk about the Sovaxon uh, vaccine. Those results were very, very, very impressive. Um, I'd love to see them hold up in the phase three trial. But right now, can anybody get into a trial? Is any trial open now? So uh, right now, uh, there is no trial that is open, uh, but uh, the surviving vaccine trial and the Ketruda or Pembrolizumab trial will open within the next month. Uh, our hope is that it should get FDA approved in this coming week. Uh, and we will uh, hopefully open the trial within a month where anyone who has a recurrent glioblastoma uh, and uh, there are obviously going to be some eligibility criteria, but they have to be in first recurrence. That means their tumor should have grown after first surgery, treatment with chemotherapy and radiation. Whether they got Optune or not, they can still go on the trial and patients will get both vaccine as well as Ketruda. So we do know that the vaccine works well uh, based on a small phase one trial that, that was done. We do know drugs like Ketruda or Nivolumab work, but they work in a small number of patients. So we are going to try to see if vaccine plus Ketruda will work well. And this should open in a month at Cleveland Clinic. So if you're interested, uh, I can give out actually a number of our office, which is 216 Four 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 six one four five, and you can contact us to see if you are going to be a candidate for the trial. Obviously, Al will have a way to reach out to us as well if you would have questions for Al. The larger trial, which is the randomized trial, uh, is going to take a little bit longer for issues of funding. But in that trial, it will be a trial in the newly diagnosed setting where anyone who has a new diagnosis of glioblastoma will undergo either the standard treatment uh, with chemotherapy radiation with or without Optune, or will get the vaccine on top. Okay, is there any possibility of getting compassionate use or right to try use of it? So right now, actually no, because there is no open and actively enrolling trial. So what I was told was that once our recurrent trial opens, that we will be able to open that program. There have been obviously been uh, limitations to produce enough vaccine. So the company Mavivax is looking into being able to do that because we do know there has been some substantial interest. We've had a lot of queries about you know, compassionate use. And our hope is we can help more patients, yes. uh, but this is something we are very actively exploring. Okay, 
are there biomarkers needed to get into the Trivaxim trial? Or does you assume that everybody has it? Uh, yeah, so great question. In the first trial, everyone had to have a surviving expression of their tumor. And they also had to have a particular HLA types uh, because we initially thought that a particular HLA may derive a better benefit with survival. Based vaccine, what we found was that not to be true. All different types of HLA that we tested uh, who went on the study got a benefit. So the second trial that we're going to do in reference will not have such requirement. Although we will collect that data to see who gets better benefit compared to maybe not that good of a benefit. But those HLA testings and survival testing of the tumor are not eligibility, but we will like to have their tissue as well as test their blood to look at the HLA to see what or which kinds of patients get better responses. Is there any uh, way to tell maybe a blood test or whatever that the vaccine is actually working before you see the change on MRI? So we saw, I didn't share it in great detail, but we do see increase in the antibody to survive in. So patients who have a higher antibody uh, expression in their blood or uh, quantities in their blood typically get a more robust or a prolonged response. So yes, there are there's at least initial preliminary data. Now we are also very actively looking at in terms of genomic profiling that can we also find genomic predictors of vaccine benefit. We should have that data within the next four weeks. Okay. Okay, let's move on to the nivolumab plus BEV trial. Um, this is going to sound terrible, but is it free to patients? Uh, so, you know, not, uh, listen, financial toxicity is a big challenge in cancer patients. We it's all realize this. Right. It's a major, major problem that unfortunately our patients and their families have to go through when they get this very difficult diagnosis. Right. So the way this trial is built, uh, in full disclosure, I am the principal investigator of the trial and this trial is supported by a grant from BMS, which is the company that makes uh, Abdivo or Nivolumab. Everyone will get the Nivolumab free of charge on the trial. The Bevacizumab or Avastin, because it's considered standard treatment, is going to be billed to people's insurance. All the standard tests that we are doing on the trial will be billed to their insurance, which idly speaking, their insurance should cover. Whatever will be the research test that we are doing will be free to the patient. So the research drug and the research test are covered by the grant and the company support. Uh, all the standard treatment will be billed to the insurance. Good. We have a uh, co-payment assistance program for BEV, but not for Nivolumab. And we always get questions, but Nivolumab is very expensive and people are always trying to find a way to get that cheaper. So oh, absolutely. to your trial. Okay. I, I can say one of our patients who, who had resources came to see us from an outside city, did not want to travel wanted to get it, you know, and was willing to pay for it. And when the numbers they got was pretty high, it was close to 30,000. And so they decided to participate in the trial because it's almost cost prohibitive. Yeah, that's 30,000 per month, right? Yes. Um, you mentioned about all the swelling. Uh, are there other ways to reduce the swelling other than steroids and Avastin? What ever happened to the drug Zerocept? Yeah, yeah I, I don't know where that, uh, that is, honestly. And, uh, you know, and one of the things that we are actively looking at and the next time I do a bevacizumab trial. So first of all, we are trying to specifically look at the low dose of Astin in that realm. So still steroids are the fastest and best ways to decrease swelling. We don't like steroids because they make our immunotherapy less effective. Uh, that's why our trial with nivolumab is trying to use a Vastin. Now, typically, um, I'm not a big fan of Avastin by itself, but when you're combining it with the immunotherapy, I think Avastin can give you a twofold example, uh, advantage. One is it can take away a need for steroids if there's a need for steroids. And B, Avastin itself actually goes and attacks the vascular endothelial growth factor. And VEGF or the vascular endothelial growth factor actually is immunosuppressive by itself. So if, you're produce, if your tumor is producing some of it, it's nice to get that down. So that's why we are very excited about the low dose trial, because we think with the low dose, we may not mount a uh, hypoxic reaction. That's when the tumor turns really angry and we're trying to prevent that. So I think our, our results will be intriguing. It's a large enough trial that even if there is a, a hopefully not too large of a difference even, we may be able to catch that. So stay tuned, but I, I agree completely with you. If we can find more 
effective ways of getting the edema down, I think that's definitely promising. But with, with immunotherapy, maybe a combination with Avastin may have an ad additional advantage of just not decreasing the edema, but also going and counteracting the immune system. Okay. Um, just a quick question on tocogen uh, because it's going to be covered next week. Um, you said Aptun is allowed in the control group, but not in the treatment group, correct? Yes. So I didn't say that, but you are absolutely right. I shared that with you offline. Uh, so right now, there is some preliminary data that the Optune may, uh, because Optune obviously works in stopping, you know, cell division, uh, that it prevents the cells from dividing. It may, it may impact the viral replication. So at least at this current time point, the patients who will be going in the experimental arm uh, will not be getting Optune. Okay. Um, that just makes it harder to meet the endpoint. <laughs> I, I, I certainly uh, agree with that. And, you know, uh, uh, the company is working, I'm hoping. Uh, but Harry Gruber can answer that question better than me. Uh, but based on the preliminary data, uh, you know, they were uh, uh, not in favor of at least allowing Optune. But I agree that raises the bar even more. Okay. One of the patients says they have uh, anaplastic astrocytoma. Can they get into any of these trials, like the, especially so vaccin? So, so uh, unfortunately, at this time point, the way the Cervax M trial is, it's for glioblastoma patients. Some trials, if someone's tumor comes back, unfortunately, if they do get a repeat surgery and the repeat surgery shows glioblastoma, may be able to go on some of the glioblastoma trials, how it is written. However, at the current trial, most trials, unfortunately, do restrict anaplastic astrocytomas. Now, we have another study at Cleveland Clinic where such patients can go on a different trial, but not at this, not on the Cervax M trial. Which one do you have for anaplastic astrocytoma? So there is a trial that I'm involved with called uh, Teramepracol. Uh, it's a drug uh, that we are looking at through the American Brain Tumor Consortium that's also open at other centers as well. Uh, and that trial does allow high-grade glioma patients. And I'm happy to provide that information to you. Uh, it was not on uh, the list because it's not an investigator initiated trial because although I have written that study, I'm doing that as a part of a cooperative group study and it's open at other centers too, like Johns Hopkins. Okay. Um, let me see. I think that's all the questions that we had. Uh, but I want, oh, actually one more quick question. Uh, this is not related to trials, but how long do you think Timidar should be used after radiation? Some people are saying six months, some 12, some longer. Yeah, so that is a great question. And I think it's, it's a question with honestly, no one has a very good complete answer, but I can share with you what we know. So we do know that methylated patients clearly get a greater benefit with temozolomide as compared to those who are unmethylated. So the study that was done through the EORTC consortium clearly had only looked at six cycles, which is the only 11-1 direct evidence of the benefit of temozolomide. And this was chemotherapy radiation for six weeks, followed by six cycles. When they combined data from four large trials, and some of these trials allowed patients getting temozolomide for six months, and some of these trials actually allowed getting temozolomide for even 12 months. And when they looked at it, what they found in retrospective manner or post hoc manner means these trials were not specifically designed to look at this question, but they aggregated all the data and wanted to answer this very important question. So what they found was twofold. One is that the MGMT patients who have a MGMT methylation, where most of the benefits from temozolomide is derived, they had a progression-free survival benefit. That means the tumor took longer to come back if they got 12 cycles compared to six. However, the overall survival did not change at all. So whether you got six cycles or 12, even in the MGMT methylated patients, there was no difference. Now, in those who were unmethylated, there was no difference of either progression-free survival or overall survival. So in my patients who are MGMT methylated, I have this discussion. I typically, in my common practice, will stop at six months if they are having any toxicities of the drug or having problems with nausea and some of the other quality of life related issues. If someone's methylated, I do have this discussion and I'm open to going up to 12, but I tell them there is no level one evidence of a benefit and B, whatever retrospective benefit we have or retrospective evidence we have is that there is only a progression free survival benefit and not an overall survival benefit. Now, the one caveat though is we are also finding out at least in the low grade tumors, 
that patients who get temozolomide can develop more genetic mutations, uh, what they call as a hypermutator phenotype. And then there is some preliminary evidence that these patients may have a greater benefit to immunotherapy down the lane. However, uh, has this been shown to be uh, a reasonable approach in a prospective manner? No. We and several others are trying to look at our data to see if there is any difference in those patients. So I think in the next six to 12 months, we may have a slightly better idea on that aspect. Okay, thank you. Um, before we go, I just want to talk to the audience about a, a separate topic, an advocacy topic uh, that I need help with, and then I'll just say goodbyes. Um, on Friday, Medicare released a proposed rule on paying for Optune. Uh, Optune's been available for five years now, and until now, Medicare has never paid for it. They just announced that they will start paying for it, but with very severe restrictions, such as you have to be treated at a major center. Uh, they won't let you go to a community center, which is completely crazy because you would think the opposite. At the major centers, you have all the clinical trials available, and all the community hospitals where you don't have the trials, you need Optune. So that one makes no sense. And other things such as you have to start within seven weeks of radiation ending. Uh, and at that point, you cannot have any progression on the scan. And as you know, half the people have progression on the scan at that point. So you're not going to go for another half. A whole bunch of little things like that, just to make it so that Medicare saves money. Uh, we're going to try fighting this. I'm going to announce how sometime in the next couple of days. But just sign up for our newsletter, the Brain Tumor News Blast, and I'll send the link out. And I'll explain how we want phone calls and emails sent out, uh, if, if, everybody, if everybody could help with that. OK, and that's it for today. Uh, we have another webinar on Wednesday. This Wednesday night at 7, the topic is going to be the drug onc 201 for DIPG and H3K27M uh, mutant gliomas. Um, we also have one next Sunday. We're going to have a whole presentation on tocogen. And that's it. Happy Mother's Day to all, and thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you for your kind invitation, Al. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.